Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Women and Shakespeare. I'm your host, Dr. Varsha Bantwani. I have been drawn to the work of our podcast guest, Professor Alexa Alice Jugo. So are there any particular examples of translation that you have really enjoyed while you were researching for your MIT Global Shakespeare's project and your new book, Xenophone Adaptations of Shape and Anthology from 1987 to 2007? I suppose I should begin with one of the most famous sayings in Shakespeare, to be or not to be. But who is the subject? In fact, Shakespeare himself is brilliant at playing with multiple languages. This is well known thanks to research from past decades, multilingual Shakespeare, right? How he evokes different worlds, how he uh, refers to accents, but also used long words, borrowed words. And so for me, actually, the Shakespearean canon itself is beautifully multilingual. And it stands to reason that the new beauty would emerge from this when you put Shakespeare through translation. Rasha, you mentioned my new book, Sinophone Adaptations of Shakespeare. I edited that book in which I and my team translated seven plays from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China back into English. So those plays were, were adaptations of Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear. It's, it's really uh, eye-opening for us to go through the process of what we call back translation in the Chinese rendition of to be or not to be. Since the language, unlike Japanese, you do need a subject. They all frequently add I or we, or uh, in the question form, is it? Is it advisable to do something? If you think about Shakespeare's formulation, it's fascinating. It's, it's so quotable, memorable, there's symmetry to it, even though it does not specify who the subject is. And further, it does not specify the action, right? The to be verb, you'll find in English grammar book, but it's almost never used in this form in spoken English. To be, to be what? In fact, you need the object. So not just the subject is missing, but the object is also missing. So when we wrestle with passages like this, and then when you engage with different languages, so even with, with simple words like fair, which typically means white, beautiful, virtuous, in a play like Othello, there's so much to be said. It makes you pause, right? The to be or not to be, or the word fair in Othello, when engage with translation or back translation, now you suddenly pause and rethink your assumptions, what you assume to be very familiar. For me, to be or not to be has a problem. It is too familiar to be properly known. Most people heard of it, but they rarely pause and think about the innovations as well as what it could actually possibly point toward. And translations open up these gaps. So it is about what is gained in translation, but also ironically, in many ways, translations return us to the core of Shakespeare, to the undiscovered country, because it's too familiar. I completely agree with you. Oftentimes, I think, oh, this is interesting how they've translated this word, and therefore I go back to the text and look it up again. <laughs> that would Alexa. Alice Shugo. Dear listeners, adieu, adieu, adieu. But remember to tune in to Women and Shakespeare, streaming at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and numerous other platforms. If you want to listen to the podcast with a full transcript, head over to our website, www.womenandshakespeare.com. Until then, keep smashing the patriarchy. 